All right, I think I'm going to get us started. It seems like uh, there's a pause and people coming into the room. So I just want to say welcome to all of you on behalf of the Dresher Center. I'm sorry that I couldn't be there in person. This is Jessica Berman, director of the Dresher Center. Most of you know me, um, but not everybody. So um, I'm really, really excited to be doing this um, Humanities Teaching Lab. This is our first one of 2024 in partnership with the Public Humanities Minor. And um, really what I'm here to do is to introduce Earl Brooks, who is our new director of the Humanities Teaching Labs. Um, Lindsay DeKerchy did it for many years, um, but Earl is now associate director in the Dresher Center, yay. Um, he's uh, assistant professor in the English department and associate director in the Dresher Center. And we're very, very uh, lucky to have him with us and grateful that he's taken over running the humanities teaching labs. So I'm really just going to turn it over to Earl, but um, I wanted to welcome you first. So Earl. All right. Thank you. And welcome everyone. I'm going to stand up just so I can project. So I want to first thank you all for, for showing up on a Friday. I'm really excited for this uh, workshop. And I know I've heard a lot of folks have been really excited about this coming up. I want to just introduce uh, Jamila quickly and then give us a few minutes so that we can all do introductions um, as well. Uh, so uh, Jamila is currently the Baltimore Banners digital editor. She creates, curates, and publishes content on the Baltimore Banners digital platforms. And Jamila's background is in radio as a producer, reporter, and host. She has also previously served as WYPR's digital content director and the executive producer of Wavelength, Baltimore's public radio journey. Jamila is also um, has served as an instructor here at UMBC in MCS and she taught their podcasting course, which is MCS 366. Okay, uh, so please join me in welcoming you, Myla. Uh, and I also want to take a moment for us to do introductions. So you already met me. Um, but we can do introductions in the room, and then we'll pass it to you all online. So but we'll go to my left. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Courtney Hobson. I'm program manager here in the Dresser Center. Hi, I'm Jewel Lee. I'm an undergraduate student of Africana American Studies and Public Humanities. Uh, Sarah Fowles, assistant professor in American Studies. Kate Drabinsky, uh, lecturer in Gender, Women's, and Sexuality Studies. Jessica, we're kicking it to the screen. Um, I already introduced myself, oh, so sorry. I'm going to pass it to uh, Tanya. Hi, everyone. My name is Tania Lizarazo. I'm Associate Professor in Modern Languages and Global Studies. Viridiana? I'm sorry. Hello, everyone. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Viridiana Colosio, and I'm a uh, graduate student in the Intercultural Communication Program. And I pass it to uh, Desiree. Good morning, everyone. Desiree Sterling. I am an alumna of the Text Technologies and Literature Program at UMBC. Currently coordinator for pre-transfer advising in the Office for Academic and Pre-Professional Advising and adjunct faculty for English at Howard Community College. And I pass it to Sid Gemma. Hi, everyone. I'm Gemma. And I'm, I'm also student, a student in the master's, uh, master in intercultural communication. And Jim, Jamila? Well, that's me. I guess I'll pass it to Maria. <laughs> this is Maria Sayeri. I'm an assistant professor in the Gender, Women's, um, and Sexuality Studies Department, and I'll pass it over to Julie. Hi, I'm Julie Kim. Um, I'm a doctoral student in the Language, Literature, Literacy, and Culture program. I think that's you, Hi, I don't know if you can hear me, but uh, I'm driving a car down to Rockville, Maryland at Montgomery College where I teach. Hi, nice to meet all of you. Safe travels. All right. Welcome everyone to Safe Travels, JT. 
Um, I guess we'll go ahead and, and turn it over. Okay, yeah. great. Um, thank you everyone for being here in person and virtually, especially on a, on a Friday. I know your schedules are probably very busy, so just appreciate your time and so happy to be back on campus. Um, it's been, I think, maybe a year or more since I've um, uh, instructed the 366 class. Um, that was such a great experience, and I just was always amazed with the projects that um, UMBC students came up with and just the just the capabilities and ideas and everything. I just was uh, always so thankful to, to be able to work with them every semester and hopefully again in the future. Um, can you all see me? Uh, I haven't shared my screen yet, um, but I will in just a second. Um, so I just have a couple of slides just to kind of keep myself organized. The things I um, am going to be covering today is um, equipment. Um, we're going to end with an editing, um, a short session. I'm going to talk about crafting a story and project management and timeline. Um, just from my experience, um, um, as Dr. Brooks said, I, uh, my background is in radio and podcasting um, as a, a reporter and producer. Um, and also working in podcast development, um, which is something that I'm still doing at the Baltimore Banner right now, um, uh, working on two sports podcasts, um, uh, the Banner Ravens podcast and the Adam Jones podcast, Sports is Not My Forte. <laughs> so I'm mostly just supervising and making sure that everything, uh, the, the trains run on time, essentially. Um, but content-wise, I can just tell you a little bit about process from, from my experience. Um, and bear with me, I have a lot of links <laughs> uh, uh, for this presentation. We're going to listen to a few things um, just to have an example, and uh, I'll just get started. Um, so this is sort of a, a, a process that I have shared with students over the past couple of years um, as I've done workshops and classes, uh, just about how, in my experience, the, the sort of process has taken shape. And I wanted to start at the very beginning, um, and then we'll kind of move through, through this. Um, and so I think every project starts with an idea, right? But there's a difference between an idea and a story. Um, and I want to explain that a little bit with a sort of a lighthearted example. Um, with a raccoon. <laughs> Why a raccoon? Um, it's just the animal that I'm into these days. I love animals and I'm very much into raccoons right now. Um, but to put this in an example form, I could say if I'm at a pitch meeting and I'm around the table with, you know, fellow producers, executive producers, and I'm trying to, to, to kind of share and sell this idea to them. If I just said, I want to do a podcast or I want to do an episode about raccoons, that's an idea that's very general, that's very broad. But a story has so much more, it's layered. It has a focus, a more narrow fo focus. It has characters, who are the voices, who are the people that we're gonna talk to? It has a central question. What am I trying to either uncover or what am I trying to focus on? What am I trying to reveal? What do I want the audience to know? It more than likely has um, a story arc or good storytelling does. Um, uh, something it either there's change that might be happening either the person has changed or a relationship has changed or their situation has changed there's this sort of you know there's a beginning middle and end but there might be um, someone might go on a journey um, there's a setting where does this take place is this a raccoon in Baltimore is this a raccoon in in Maine is this a raccoon on the other side of the you know on the other side of the world maybe there's not raccoons on the other side Oh, but you know what I'm saying. And there's also a time. Is this, you know, present day? Is this 10 years ago? Is this 30 years ago? What, you need to, like, flesh out these details. There might be stakes. Um, you know, is, is, does this raccoon stand to lose something? Or does the character, the person attached to it, stand to lose something? Meaning the raccoon. Who knows? Um, but those are some of the things that sort of broaden out and, and make something a story. So this is <laughs> just, the, apparently there's a lot of raccoon content on, out there and uh, Instagram is, is serving it to me because I looked at one, but this is a guy who domesticated and, and owns a raccoon. 
he's got a story. How did this happen? How did him and this raccoon meet each other? Did he acquire the raccoon in um, ethical ways or, you know, uh, illegal ways uh, or legal ways? Um, so those are all the things that I would try to find out in this story. Um, and this is just an exercise that I found very valuable. This is a book called Out on the Wire that I've used for previous classes. It's a great sort of, if you can see, um, I don't know if you can see see me and the, um, uh, and the, uh, what's the name of the, the oh, I'll put a picture. Sure. And I have it a list at the end. It's called Out on the Wire. Um, it's by Jessica Abel. And I'll just pass it around. It's actually a graphic novel. And it's about, it kind of walks you through the story development process. Um, and it's really, really great. It's kind of interesting that it's in a graphic novel format. Um, but I think it's engaging. Students tend to like it. Um, but she has this great, simple sentence that um, I, I share with students often. And this is sort of how you tee up your story. I'm doing a story about X. And what's interesting about it is Y. And that's just like a really short, simple way to sort of make your pitch and kind of distill uh, what your story is about. So I just kind of like to share that with folks. So once you've gone through this process, you know, you've answered these questions about, you know, the basic who, what, where, when, and why, um, and why it's interesting to you. I find that oftentimes the things that you're curious about are the things that you want to spend a lot of time uh, sort of delving into and exploring. And I think that, um, it comes out with such a much better product. You know, when I've taught here with 20 plus students, sometimes students will feel like, oh, I don't know if this is important enough, or I don't know if this is interesting enough. And I say, it is, if it's something that you're interested in and passionate about, um, you know, it's a, it's a <laughs> silly raccoon, you know, it's an example, but it could really, you know, kind of open up lots of different questions and it could be an interesting listen. So I just, help people to kind of explore the things that you're interested in. So you've got the story and be aware that it will evolve and it may take different shapes than you had originally planned. Um, you know, the questions that you had in mind, the, 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 the direction that you thought it would go in, it might deviate based on what you get from the people that you talk to, the things that you learn. So be open to, for your story to evolve um, as, as it needs to. And I just wanna start with uh, going through some of these links, um, some really great training and resources um, that, I, that I share and that I kind of go back to. Um, hopefully you can see, because I'm clicking through these. Okay, I know what I need to do. Bear with me for just one second and I will Get on the right page here. So NPR has this great training website. Um, if you've never checked it out, so many resources. Um, and this has a really great just sort of breakdown on um, the ways to structure a story or how to actually begin a story. Um, you've probably, if you've listened to podcasts, you've probably picked up some of these common methods or common um, sort of approaches. Maybe you can start with a question, um, you know, would it, what's the question to answer? Tee up the question first. Um, it could be, you know, really jump into the story first. You know, here's where we are. Here's the issue. Here's the challenge. Here's, you know, here's this, what the stakes are. Or you could ask it in a sort of present the mystery, you know, um, I think cereal is a good example of maybe either one of those. I'm also thinking of S-Town that, you know, kind of tees up, you, you know, it really like starts off with that drama too and pulls you in, you know, uh, yeah. So dive immediately into the narrative. I think, you know, with podcasting, what do they say? Like the first 30 seconds to a minute is like peak time. You really have to grab your listener in that short amount of time, or they're going to go on to the next one. There are millions of podcasts out here, you know, similar um, similar topics, similar sort of styles. So you're really sort of um, competing uh, for people's attention. So you really want to, whatever way you kind of structure and start your story, you want to make sure that it's, you know, attention grabbing and also feels authentic to the story that you're trying to tell. Don't try to make a mystery when there's not a mystery. <laughs> um, they also have established the concept first 
So you want to maybe give a little bit of context um, to help guide your reader or, excuse me, your listener, especially if it's complicated or, um, you know, if it's something maybe a little niche that not a lot of people might know about, you might want to kind of set up um, some background for them. Um, they mentioned cereal here. Um, and then there's also the personal approach, you know, why you were interested in this or why, um, you know, how your own story relates to it. Um, I think people tend to, you know, if it's compelling, that's a way for the story to kind of resonate with people. And also, you know, we've seen like how people as personalities, as audio personalities, people gravitate towards them. Um, there's like this trust and this interest in the, the, the storyteller as a person. So in ways that this may not have been an approach or a, or a strategy that would have been allowed in the past with radio or other, other, um, other, uh, mediums. And, you know, there's really no rules with podcasting. If this is, you know, if you want to start with, with a personal perspective, you really can, um, and it may be a way to hook, hook someone. So that's, you know, some of the, um, some of the options for telling the story. Next, I'm going to go to, um, ways to structure the story, but while I navigate to another link, um, does anyone have any questions just off the bat? And if not, please, at any point, just um, stop me. So next we're going to talk about story structure, which I thought was just a really, this is like a really nice way of um, explaining things. So there's the, uh, they call it the flatline story structure, and that's sort of our typical comment, response, detail, context, comment, response, detail, but, you know, just that back and forth. Um, um, that's effective, it works, um, but that might not be the approach that you want. Um, and we'll talk about sort of sound elements and how that can sort of um, dictate how you wanna, how you wanna tell the story too. Um, so then we talked about earlier, you know, having that arc and is there sort of a journey that you can take the listener on? Is there not just the beginning, middle and end, but does something change for either the character or the policy or whatever the subject matter is? Um, there's also dividing your story into acts, which most people uh, equate with This American Life. They do the very effective three-act structure. Um, that's a way that you could structure your story. And that's a really nice device for if you have a big, huge kind of broad story and you just sort of need um, need a way to break it up, um, you know, whether it's uh, sort of a, a, a time period or, you know, different parts of whatever. There's, there's, this could be very useful if you have something that's a little bit more, sort of has more range. Um, and then this is sort of the, the signpost idea of, you know, you step back and you reestablish either what's happened or what's going to happen or, you know, they, they say we have to figure this out. That's a really nice way. I mean, with, with any approach that you take, I think you should th be thinking about the listener and that they don't know as much as you do and they don't know sort of where this is going to go. So if you can stop and take breaks and explain things to them or do a quick recap or give some context, that's really helpful for them to kind of figure out where we are and where we're going. Um, because as, you know, podcasting isn't as linear, of course you can go back, but, um, and certainly I do <laughs> sometimes it's so much information, like, hold on. And, you know, we kind of like zone out and you need to kind of, uh, listen again. Um, but, but just be thinking of ways that you can help out the listener, break things down, make things easy for them to follow because they're ultimately, you know, we have our passion projects, but we want people to listen and we want to share our work with them. So, um, bring them along and make it easy, uh, easier for them if possible, but certainly don't, you know, uh, try to, flatten what you're, what you're trying to do. Um, get out of that one. Thank you for your patience as I, <laughs> again, navigate through all these, uh, through all these links. Um, so next I want to bring us to recording. 
and I think I have stopped sharing my screen. Yes. Um, bring us to the recording part. So if we go back just really quickly to the, um, to my little makeshift process here. Um, now we're at, so we've done the story, you know, we've worked on the story. We, uh, every project should involve some amount of prep. Um, even if it is about the silly raccoon, I need to know, you know, what's the typical lifespan, blah, 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 you know, all these things. So you want to do your research, of course, you want to identify who are the right people to talk about whatever your subject matter is. It could be, you know, a person familiar with the topic, directly affected by the topic. Um, it could be an expert. There's so many different types of voices that you could bring on. Um, so you want to identify what are the right ones and maybe have a conversation with them first, do a background interview or pre-interview to kind of get a sense of what you'll get from them before you commit to, you know, bringing them on board and, and re recording with them and featuring them in your project. Um, some people like to wing it. I will always write questions and then sort of have the, uh, give myself the freedom, of course, to deviate from that. I'll think of questions in the moment, of course, follow up questions, but I really like to have sort of my, um, my guide guidance there on sort of where the conversation might go. But there's been times where, you know, I've had hour long interviews and I got in a question where I could, <laughs> and I was okay with that. Um, you know, just being flexible with, with, and letting them sort of take things because oftentimes you get really, um, you get more than you expected. If you're not trying to control it so much, definitely get your questions in there, know what you, what you really need. Um, but I find that people might open up more. They might say things differently. You just really kind of, um, maybe have this co-leading uh, thing happening. Um, and then I might do an outline. Um, you know, I want to speak to to Sam, and I want to speak to Brittany, and I want to speak to Lee. Um, and this is how I think I might structure the story. Just kind of having a loose outline might help you um, and save you some time, you know, on the, on, the, on the other end. So you've done all these things, you've done your prep, now you're ready to record. And I like to say, so let me think about, let me just go to equipment. Um, so I like to say, you know, there's, there's must haves and then there's what you have. And not everyone has the things that you must have, right? So in my must have uh, idea, you gotta have headphones, no bones about it. Because what you, what you hear through these may not be what you hear just in, you know, in without them. Um, you might hear things happening in your recorder. And thank you to Dr. Fouts for sharing mm -hmm. this with me today. Um, this is a Zoom H4N, this is a very popular recorder, very easy to use. Um, it has an internal mic here, if you guys can see it. Um, that's actually pretty good, but I would also um, have a microphone to plug in um, to one of these um, outputs here. Um, so I would say, you know, maybe there's a recorder, definitely headphones, definitely, um, I would always use a, a mic, some sort of micing process. Oh, do you have one with you? I do. Excellent. I put a link in the notes that was prepared. Oh, wonderful. Yes. Wonderful. So you might have a mic with you. I would recommend you do. And the great things about, um, microphones is that they are different levels of affordability. You know, I've purchased $200 mics, I've purchased $50 mics that can be connected to your phone. Um, so it's really sort of a range there. Um, there are dynamic mics, there are condenser mics. I say um, you might want a dynamic mic for voices, um, uh, for interviews and for voices, uh, maybe a condenser mic for if you're going out into the field and you want to get ambient sound, but that all, you know, depends on what you're trying to accomplish. If you just want to have a simple sort of two way with someone and you're in the same room, you might just need, um, you could also do one mic. Um, I'm used to, you know, being out in the field and having, you know, my mic and whoop. <laughs> glad I didn't fall down that hole. You know, I'll go back and forth. You know, I'll, I'll, if I want my voice, um, in the recording, I'll turn the mic on me and I'll, I'll sort of set it up in the beginning with some ground rules. Like 
wait till I pass the mic back to you, take a second so it's not like back and forth and, you know, your voice is a little off mic. Um, and then I'll turn it back to them. So you really don't need a lot of equipment um, if you want a podcast. Is I'll, I'll show you some examples of like some really full kits. Um, but if you're just doing something a little more, um, uh, you know, with you and one person or a couple of people, you really don't need a, um, you know, to spend thousands of dollars on this, which is great. Um, Can I just say one quick thing? Sure. So um, in my department, we got, have a Mellon grant and we bought um, a bunch of equipment for an oral history project that can also be used for this. And it will be open to lend. So we have 10 um, Zoom, the H6 recorders. We've got mics. We've got uh, 12 sets of headphones. So if you start a project and you want to borrow some equipment, just um, I'm Kate Dravinsky. You can just give me a shout. Wonderful share. Wonderful. I should also say the Dresher Center bought some from our Mellon grant. So those are in the library. And I, Earl and Courtney know the details about how you can borrow those things. Yeah, I just sent Courtney a link. Courtney, you can post that in the chat as well. That link will take you to the digital media lab in the library. And they have a nice visual catalog of all the equipment that you can check out. Um, so it's it's very easy to, to navigate. Nice. I actually put that link at the bottom here. <laughs> oh, um, there it is. Yeah, it's just so many great resources there. Um, and it's nice that there's a community of, of sharing. So, um, yeah, there's the, the equipment is out there. If you want to buy your own, I just put in a couple of um, uh, a couple of shops. There's online B&H. Um, I purchased a lot with them. They're like one of the big, um, well-respected. You can get audio equipment, visual equipment computers, lighting, all sorts of things. I also like if you like to go and actually like play with things and get recommendations, Micro Center in Parkville um, is a nice place. And then there's Service Photo in Hamden that um, has some sort of smaller pieces of audio equipment. Um, so there's that, you know, there's the some form of mic, some form of um, uh, recording device, uh, headphones for sure. Um, and then there's what you have. And Almost all of us have phones, and I know people that use their phones, especially in either in breaking news situations or they might meet someone out. Um, you know, I can't speak so much for Androids. Um, no disrespect to Android users. I just know what I have uh, on the iPhone. And, you know, this, this, um, uh, what, thing, what is this? The speaker here actually isn't too bad. And, you know, you'll, you'll turn your phone so that, the speaker, which is where you plug in your um, your charger, is is uh, facing the person or whoever you're you're getting sound from. I like to do like two fists away, so it's not so close that your audio is getting blown out. That some, you know, once you get to the editing process, uh, you know, it, it can be hard to fix. Um, so you can use this. There's recording apps. There's Zoom. Um, NPR uses Zoom to record. Uh, you know, with people around the country. Of course, they're running that through a really expensive soundboard, but you have these things at your disposal. Um, and a cert certainly, you know, because of the pandemic, we sort of kind of opened up our options of what we can do with digital tools. So um, those are things that you have. You can use your, you know, your earbuds or your wireless earbuds, just having a way to, um, you know, to, to, to hear what's happening in the way that, the listener will hear. And I'll give you an example. I don't know if I'll be able to play this. And maybe it's not so important that I play it, but I'll give you a, I'll try. So just, okay. just play a couple seconds. While it's... Yeah, it's not... All here? It's not playing through the speaker. Oh, okay. No problem. Well, I'll just tell you, uh, I'll share my screen so you can see if you want to go back um, at a later time. Um, I just wanted sh to share an anecdote um, of why you need to have your headphones in. And that is, I did a, here we go. When was this? 20, it was actually 2022. So my colleague and I, John John Williams, he's a food reporter for um, the Baltimore Banner. He had this great story idea of he wanted to go into restaurants and focus on um, the um, uh, the family meal, which is before the uh, the 
before the restaurant opens, uh, at many restaurants, they have something called family meal where um, the restaurant employees eat together. And this is really wonderful um, sort of process where they eat together, really great food. And they just like have a good time and get to know each other. And he wanted to spotlight how um, several restaurants in the city have, um, have immigrant populations uh, uh, in their employee workforce and how the family meal becomes a means for them to share their, um, their culture and their food with, uh, with, you know, the people in the, uh, the other staff in the restaurants. So we thought, Hey, let's turn this into a, an audio story. You know, immediately when he talked to me, I started thinking of, you know, all the sounds that would be in that kitchen. Um, do you even think? No, no, no. Okay. Um, all the sounds that would be in that kitchen, the clanking, the, you know, people yelling back and forth to each other. And I just heard like this cacophony of sound. And I was like, yeah, I think that would work for audio. So we went to um, Chingale and uh, this is one of the head chefs here. And we just spent like probably an hour and a half, two hours in that kitchen. And I'm walking around with my mic, um, you know, going to different people's workstations and, you know, getting the sound of the industrial mixer and people chopping and all of these great sounds. But when we got to the stove, sorry, I'm getting really close to the, uh, to the camera. When we got to the stove, this had never happened to me before, but I guess I hadn't recorded in a commercial kitchen. The flame was creating this crazy interference with the microphone. And for a second, like it took me a, a minute to, for it to dawn on me, like what was happening? And you could just hear like the, and I couldn't figure out what was going on. And then, you know, I figured it out and I was like, that's cool. But also I'm really glad I have headphones because had I not been wearing headphones and hear how, heard how the sound was, you know, processing, I wouldn't have known that. So that's just an example of um, why headphones are so important. Um, but that was a really fun story to do. And they fed us after and the food was nice. <laughs> um, but I wanted to show you um, some kits that are not very um, sort of stripped down just for fun. And this is back to the NPR training website. And they have this um, fun feature that you'll see in a second um, called what's in your bag. So you can see uh, what NPR reporters kits look like. And this is obviously not the three piece kit that I shared with you. Um, this reporter has uh, a Marantz, which is another really popular um, uh, recording uh, recorder that's been around for a long time. I think this is a Zoom. I can't really read the writing. I don't think so. It looks like more, more words than that. Um, I think she's got a couple mics here. Of course, she's got headphones. She's got XLR cables to attach the mics to the recorders. Um, she might also have cords that can plug into a mold box if she's at a press conference or something like that. All those batteries. All those batteries, yes. Yes, for sure. Batteries, uh, digital hard drives, um, memory cards, yeah. So, you know, she's got a windscreen here. Um, if, it's a, if it's a windy environment, she's got a, a grip on her microphone that helps with um, mic handling noise. And if there's vibrations, if she's like set up on a tabletop, that helps to reduce that. Um, so this is just to show, you know, if you're really a gear person and get excited by these things, um, you, you can do that, but uh, you don't necessarily need to. Um, that's more radio reporting. I also wanted to show you, but that can also be used for, um, you know, in the field or, or other podcast um, interviews. I also wanted to show you just this from Wired. This is more geared to like in-home studios. Um, if you want to, you know, have um, equipment that could can do that too. Um, and I can share all these links and I have some links at the end too. Um, an audio interface, if you are going to be recording in, uh, in either in a, could do that in this space or you could do it at home. This is if you have um, more than one microphone. This I think is only showing one output. But if you do have, let's say a round table or several people and you need multiple microphones to plug in, that's going to allow you to run it to your computer. And you can also use um, an audio uh, an audio software like Riverside, or there's there's so many other ones 
And that allows you to balance the levels. So if you have someone who's a really loud talker and then you have someone that whispers, you're gonna need to adjust. Uh, oh, thank you, Jessica. Have a good day. Um, you're gonna need to adjust those levels because if not, it's gonna be a really unpleasant listening experience for folks. It's gonna be really, really loud for one person and then they're gonna be struggling and adjusting on their, on their phones or however they listen to try to hear the other person. You can sort of normalize the levels uh, in the post-production process, but you wanna try to get a handle of them um, while you're recording. So that's one thing. Um, and the one they shared, um, Focusrite, that's a, a very, very popular one. I think you can get it for like around two or 250. Um, we talked about the portable recorder. There's the Zoom, a pop filter. That's for if, you know, they're called plosives, you know, the P's and the T's that we sort of like, a big sound comes out of our mouth. And they're a little distracting if you keep hearing them over and over and they're sort of un soften. So this just helps to reduce those plosives um, so that you don't have to do so much needling in the editing process. Again, not super necessary, um, but if you're just thinking of quality and you really like are in, in to this and, and want to do it. Um, of course, headphones, uh, mic stands, blah, blah, blah. This is more if you're doing video. Um, so I just wanted to show you those things. Um, before we move on, uh, go back, then go back. Now, we talked about equipment. Um, I'll just quickly go through um, the next thing in this process. I say, you know, you record, you pull and organize your audio. Um, this is something that I struggle with, but it always bites me in the end. Organize, label, be consistent do it at the beginning or else it's going to just cost you valuable time in the end. Um, yeah. You know, set up your folders. If it's, you know, according to particular people that you've talked to, um, you know, Jason's audio or it's the day and then you want to kind of filter in people that way. You can do that. You want to always um, label your audio that has not been touched. that has not been edited raw. And then once you start doing your edits, you want to, you know, put at the end edit or you can put it at the beginning. But you always want to keep that raw audio because if you start recording over it or, or, or ed, excuse me, making edits over that and you lose that raw audio, then it's, it's not what you want. So just keep it, you know, try to be diligent about being good about organizing your audio, making sure you know where it is. Maybe you want it to live in different places on your computer. But then I've had this happen, which um, happened not too long ago. Computer dies and you don't have your audio backed up somewhere on the cloud or somewhere, you lose everything. Um, so that's just my little piece of advice. Um, and then you want to listen to everything that you have. I listen a couple of times. And for some people, part of the process is to transcribe. Um, for others, they just put in timestamps. You know, I know. 12 to 15 was a good section. That's all I need. Um, I like to be a little bit more clear about the transcription process or, or specific. Um, one resource, you know, you don't have to be doing that word for word like we used to. Um, Otter AI is a really popular transcription service. You just upload your audio, you give it a little bit of time depending on how long it is, and it shoots out a transcript for you. Now you want, you're more than likely going to have to go back and clean it up because it has given me kooky words um, and, and doesn't quite understand everything that people say, um, but it, it really saves you some time to give you a head start. And then, depending on what style you're going for, if it's just a simple conversation, you, you're not gonna need a script. But if you're doing a more narrative format and you have different pieces of sound, you have you know ambient sound and you have various, uh, several voices, maybe you have some archival tape, you are going to want some sort of blueprint to help you guide and transition through these different elements. Um, I can show you maybe a script template. No, that's more text than anything. Um, if you want to see some examples of scripts, I'll, I'll be happy to send them to you. But for the sake of time, I'll just um, skip that one. Um, 
The next part in the process I say is to isolate your acts, which is just a radio term that means actualities, um, what someone actually said. So if I talk to someone for an hour and I know that there are four two minute um, sections that I want, then I'm gonna pull those out from the transcript and I'm gonna put those into my script with the timestamps. So you wanna isolate those. Um, there's two ways of doing it when you get into the editing process. You can put in your full file, and I'll show you what that looks like um, shortly. You can put in your full file and edit from there, or you can pull them out and make different files for those individual small sections. That's the way I like to do it. It just works better for my brain. You don't have to do it that way. Um, but you want to make sure you know what your timestamps are for where you get in and you get out. Um, and then tracking. Again, this is a, a, this is a more narrative process. Tracking is essentially just your narration. If you know that you need some transitions to guide you from person A to person B, you're gonna write that. You're probably gonna tee it up some way. Um, you know, uh, Cindy uh, uh, reflects on her time, you know, working in downtown Baltimore in 1982. Um, examples from family. And then you're gonna have Cindy say that. Um, so you, you might need to kind of give that set up. Um, so in order to do that, you're gonna to need to write it and you're gonna to need to record yourself in one of these methods. Um, so that's what tracking is. And then I'll go ahead and get audition pulled up. Does anyone have any questions um, so far just about this process or, yeah, please Desiree. Yes, I was curious about um, like music transitions. Yeah. How you would like optimize the audio between like the microphone pickup of actual conversations and then blending that into music transitions. That's a great question. I will, um, I'll just show you sort of what that, what that looks like. I might be able to better explain it um, through, through that example. Um, Okay. You, but to, to sort of um, answer the question before we get to the editing part, you want it to be as smooth as a transition as possible. Um, you don't want the music to be jarring, going from, you know, a voice um, to music. Um, and I find that if you have music with a vocal, coming out of a vocal, it's sometimes just too much. So I usually always try to find instrumental, but if there's a lyric that I want to have sort of in the clear that I want people to hear, I'll make sure I'll bring that up and just have that lyric be the only thing that people hear and then I'll fade it down and then get back into the voice. So it's really about what you wanna showcase and making sure that you're showcasing one thing at a time so that it's not too distracting. Um, so I just wanted to go back to the this sort of um, workflow really quickly just to show you and explain before I get into editing um, the types of sound that you can have. So I talked about acts. I talked about tracks, which is your narration. You could have ambient sound if you want to sort of put people into the place. So um, I've had students go out um, on class nights and walk around and record in different places. Um, you know, in the gym, the sounds of weights being dropped or... Uh, in a parking lot, if they're doing a story about, you know, uh, parking in, in the, in, on campus or something like that, if you want people to sort of hear what it sounds like, and I think you should in particular stories, um, you're going to want to record ambient sound. And that's, you know, um, at least a, a minute, probably more of you just walking around with your microphone, getting close to that sound source and just holding the mic and just picking up that sound or walking around doing sort of a sweep to just get like the kind of full soundscape of something. Um, I just think that that's a really good way to sort of bring a story to life. And I, I love recording ambient sound. Um, then you might have music um, either in the beginning and end, or you might weave it through. Maybe you have sound effects uh, if, if that feels right for your story. Um, uh, and then of course you'll have your voices, you might have, um, I really love using archival sound if I can, you know, get my hands on it and if it's a, a good way to, to 
present something. Um, so those are just the options. So you're listening again, you're putting things in the timeline, and this is what I mean when I say putting things in the timeline. Bear with me for just a second. Maybe this will work. Yep, that worked. Okay. Um, my apologies. I'm just going to show you audition. I can pull up um, audacity because I know that's what people have access to here. I can I can pull that up um, quickly. I'm most um, if I am knowledgeable about anything, uh, I've spent the most time in audition since I started um, my career. So that's what I'm quickest on. That's what I know. But the workflows are very similar. Um, so I'll just show you sort of how I lay things out in audition, and then we can look at um, audacity if you want. Um, can I make a comment? Sure. Correct me if I'm wrong, but UMBC faculty has access to audition. Yes. But not. Not students. Do they still, the students still have access in the labs? Or did it need to? I think they have access in them, but I don't want to be definitive. Gotcha. Okay. It could change. Okay. I'll, um, I'll pop up both. Um, but these are just sort of like the principles that, um, just to give you sort of like a basic overview. Um, so I just have none of these clips that I have up here have anything to do with each other. It's just, they're just there for example. So I'll just tell you that. Um, so this is a um, piece of audio that I just had to do a quick edit on uh, earlier this week. This is the Adam Jones podcast. There was just someone stumbled and it was more distracting to hear them stumble than to just quickly take it out. Um, so just to do them uh, a solid, because I'm sure they would have been like, oh, why didn't you take out that, <laughs> that 15 seconds where I couldn't remember the name of something? Um, so this is just a full, what is this, uh, 40, 46 minutes of audio. Um, this is just a 13 second clip, um, an actuality. This is the theme, and then this is music. So if I were to, having all these pieces, pretending that they're part of my project, um, to get all these pieces together, I would then need to go to multi-track. And I'm just going to test for you. So multi-track is the view that allows you to pull in different pieces of audio, and, and this is the timeline, and then you can start plotting them out how you want them to. You can do fades. You can um, just start to add in, sort of get your whole piece together. So let's say that this is... And I'm going to shorten this because it's too long and kind of unwieldy. So let's say that this is an interview that I've done with someone. And then I want to have maybe a clip that I've done with someone else. I'm going to put this. This is just kind of how I organize it because it makes sense uh, for my brain. doesn't mean that you have to do it that way. I'm going to put each piece of audio on a different track, on a different row. And then this is another piece that I know I want to go in somewhere around here. And just for the sake of showing an example, this one down here. Zoom out. So this is kind of where the magic happens of putting the piece together. Um, earlier I said I like to do my edits in the individual um, files. So if I know I don't want this section, it's you know not central to what they're saying, I'm going to cut it here, and then it's going to tell me it's reference in multi-track, which I can ignore. Um, I'm going to cut it there, and then I'm going to bring it over here. Some people like to edit here, so they make, may make cuts in multi-track 
chop up their files or do whatever they need to do. That just doesn't work for me. Um, so that's why I do it elsewhere. Um, sorry, so with these long files. Um, so back to the music question. Um, this is actually music. I'm not sure. Did we get the, um, Courtney, did we get the audio sort of? Okay, no problem then. I'll just, um, just put in, be thinking of your favorite song. <laughs> and that's what we're listening to. Um, so this is a person talking. And then down here is my music. So I'm going to decide, because you are the composer, you're going to decide where you think that music should come in. I think transitions are a nice place for music um, between one voice to another. If there's like, if you think about it as like a chapter, like one chapter ending, maybe in that three act structure, that would be a nice place for music. Um, certainly if there's like an emotional, like an emotional change in the conversation, maybe you want to put appropriate music there, you know, to match tonally what, what's happening. Um, so let's say I want music coming out of this portion of the interview and I want the music to be there. I'm gonna start the music before the person ends what they're saying, depending on what it is. Um, so to do that, maybe I'll identify if they take a breath, if there's a pause, or if they start a new sentence, maybe that's when I'm gonna bring my music in and then I'm gonna let it ride until they finish what they're saying. So this is my music here, this is the, comp this is the, the, the voice. Um, what you're gonna to wanna to do is you don't want that music to come at full volume. You want it to fade in and to fade, there's two ways you can do it. In audition, it's just, you hover and then you see this little block here. You can pull it in and I'm not being like, is, uh, as persnickety as, <laughs> as I would be just for the, uh, for the sake of the, the conversation, but this is a way to fade. Um, so then it comes in, you know, the, the music is at a lower volume and then it gets louder and then it gets louder. And then I want it to be at its loudest point when the person is finished talking. So let's say that's here. So you'll hear it a little bit. It'll be faint or not faint. It, it won't be as loud as the vocal, of course. And then when they're finished talking, then I might have it at its full volume. You can also do that with these plot points here. This is essentially the same. So you can make the music at one volume, you can bring it up. This is just me bringing it up louder, louder. And then I'm gonna have, so you faded in on it when the person was talking, as the next person comes in or a continuation of the conversation comes in, you're gonna make sure that it, that the volume drops, that it's like a fade out before their vocal comes in. Make this a little bigger so you can see. So before the next vocal or the next voice comes in, I'm gonna bring that down. And I could spend like 20, 15, 20 minutes trying to perfect this so that it has like a nice polished sound, but um, probably spend too long. <laughs> Um, but that's kind of the idea. You want it to be, you want to use music to punctuate, but you never want it to distract or like conflict. Um, and I think depending on, depending on what your project is, music can be a really sort of powerful tool to, um, to highlight things or to, uh, to punctuate. Um, uh, does that kind of answer your question, Desiree? It does. Thank you. You're welcome. Can I, can I ask a question about music? Is it? Is it true that like you can have thirty seconds of songs like oh know, like popular music like, writes the music? How does that work? That's what we were told in radio. Every time I look this up for podcasting, I never can I never feel confident mm -hmm. in the answer, so I don't use popular music and podcasts anymore. I'll okay. use royalty free fair use music. Okay. Um, and there are a number of websites. Um, Envato. Uh. There's another one that we, we have a subscription to. Um, I just feel like just in case, yeah, yeah. 
unless it's in the public domain, um, and what is that, 100 years, I think. Um, so that might not be your <laughs> the style of music you want, um, but but you know that that is uh, free to use. Um, yeah, I just always like to. Yeah, um, but if anyone you know finds something definitive, I mean, there's just a number of resources out there, but I just feel like it's so murky, um, and some you know artists and their labels are a little bit more you know, screening these things to see how they're used. And I've only worked for like smaller shops and it's like, oh, I don't know if we want to put resources into, into fighting that. Um, so that's that. Um, so we put our things in the timeline, we've listened, you know, once you've made all these adjustments and your music is just right and you, you know, have everything laid out the way that you, you want to, um, then you want to listen to the whole thing you know, in multi-track as it is, listen, and then you're going to make adjustments again. This process is like the most time, one of the most time consuming things to me because I probably get um, a little obsessive with it and want it to be just right. And then I listen back to it later and I'm like, even after it's out, it's like, oh, I could have done this thing differently. Um, but this process of just listening and and tweaking and listening and tweaking you should do that. Um, don't drive yourself crazy as I have in this workflow. I have sigh, listen, scream, edit, and then you're like, okay, if I have a deadline, I just got to get it done. Um, but it, it can, you can go through several rounds in this. Uh, when I say mix down, I mean this takes all these discrete parts and makes it into one file. And that's usually the last step of, of every process. Um, and so you'll just export it mix down, um, multi-track mix down. That's the audition. Um, sounds fun. It sounds fun, multi-track. Yeah, down. that's right. <laughs> it's like the best when you can, you can click that button and then I'll listen to the mix down and then I might go back to the, to the multi-track session and make edits that way. Um, I, I thought this morning and again, organization, um, I thought this morning it would be fun to show you all what a uh, track looked like for something that I worked with uh, um, or something that I worked on. Um, there were, I knew I took this picture, but I couldn't find it. It was of a session that I had for like a 40 minute episode. And I had like 10 voices, uh, multiple pieces of archival sound, different music. It was just like this collage on the screen. Um, and that's really fun to me, like being in that. Um, I don't get to do that that often anymore, um, but I, I, I love doing that. Um, so that's kind of like the beginning to end part of the process. Um, we won't get to play, play an example that I was going to pull up, but it is an example of in a four minute clip when I had seven pieces of audio. Um, I think I had five voices. No, I had four voices, two pieces of archival sound and music in a four minute section. And it, it drove me crazy, but in a good way, <laughs> it was really fun, but it's like a lot to kind of manage and, and make sure that you get right. Um, but if that's the type of thing you want to do, have fun with it. Um, if it's not, if, again, if you want to have, you know, you talking to another person, you might want to have some music, you might not. That's, that's totally up to you. So I'm, I'm not trying to put it out there that you have to be like, you know, super ambitious and have these big layered sessions because sometimes just the intimate intimacy of just two voices talking to each other or just one voice. It muted on y'all end. Oh no. No, go ahead, go ahead. You're good. <laughs> I'm what I'm I can play the audio. Oh, okay. For you. Ooh, working magic over there. Yeah. Yeah. All right, we now have to Um can you go back to the um to the slide? Yes. Yep. So it's that first one. Uh can you actually put the link in the chat because I can Oh sure. Yep. Yep. 
I'll just give uh, just a little bit of context. So um, I worked on this uh, was it six part series uh, about the history of public radio in Baltimore in 2022, I believe. Um, and it was something that our that YPR's former station manager wanted to do for the 20th anniversary of the station, but he didn't want to just make it a, oh, here's our history. So we came up with the idea of looking at, because Baltimore is a rich city of public radio, um, and so we wanted to look at um, the histories of um, other stations, WEAA, w, what is now WTMD, WBJC, and I think there was one more. Um, but I had the challenge. This is very like insidery stuff. Not everybody's interested like in how these stations sort of came to be and the different management and the politics and all that stuff. So I kind of had a challenge of how to make it interesting to others. And there's like so much name dropping and just different things. And so music helped me sort of give some momentum to the story when people were just talking. And so this is just a section that I wanted to um, uh, tee up. This is the, the four minute section that I was telling you about. Um, and if we could start it at like 227, Courtney, if it's possible, and then we could cut it around like 625, but I'll, I'll cue you. Um, so I had to tell, I had to tell this one part of the story when, um, John Hopkins it was was a uh, no problem when Johns Hopkins University no no longer wanted to have a public radio station they wanted to sell the station and then there was so much community support that um, people fought it and said no we want to keep a radio station but they had to form a um, they had to to buy the station from Hopkins so that's an important part of the story but again how to make this most interesting. So I did the best that I could. What people were saying was interesting to me, but I just wasn't sure. Um, and so I tried to use, you know, have different people pick up the story and tell it from their perspective and then add in a little music and then add in a, a piece of sound. So this is just that. Ken was interested in acquiring us. And of course, yeah. Fine, there were it's lots of religious groups that wanted that would have paid a lot of money to have us become a religious station and to give the university credit they made it clear that was not what they wanted to do they wanted to keep it as an npr station or as a public radio station so as all this was going on mark steiner was our talk show host at the time and he started putting together a group to try and buy it and keep it as an independent radio station. The only staff member that really joined the effort was a woman named Martha Rutsky, who was then the marketing director for WJHU. And she and I uh, formed the Maryland Public Radio Corporation that was um, incorporated as a nonprofit. We knew we had to raise $5 million and on how we were going to do that was the question. Hopkins would not let us use the membership list to raise money to buy the station. So I had a list of 500, 700 odd people who I had been in touch with over the years who were listeners, maybe more even. Um, and I had that list of names, and I, so I put that in our database and started writing everybody. So they, so it, we, um, the first people, two people who came in first, one was Bill Clark. The other was the Daniels family. And then, then was the folks at Town Creek Foundation um, that they, they supported it too. So we had this initial burst of serious um, contributions and then they went after other contributions um, from, from, um, from listeners. And uh, so we ended up with three quarters of a million dollars, which was not enough to buy the station, but it was a significant down payment. <laughs> So uh, Mark was put in touch with Tony Brandon, who was living in Baltimore, and Tony had a string of commercial stations. I'm Tony Brandon. I was the general manager of WIPR from 2002 to 2019. I had been in the radio business for uh, probably at that time 30 years. We had a family company that I uh, was president of called American
I think you get the point. A lot of background, a lot of, you know, which isn't the most interesting thing, but, you know, kind of important to the story because it also introduced all the, not all the, there were a lot of players. Um, and then there were a lot of people who wanted to be a part of the conversation. So um, that was the thing to balance too. But um, when I thought, okay, I gotta have something to like, you know, move this along, I was thankful for it. Um, because I think it just kind of helps to give a little bit more oomph to something that could be a little dry if it didn't have it. So music can be very helpful um, in that way. Um, I tried to download Atlassian. I should have done this before, but I need an admin password because it's my work computer. <laughs> um, of course. It's, it's, it's pretty, <laughs> the process is very yeah. important. Yeah. But you just, yeah, you okay. The steps um, are literally out that the, the software looks a little different, mm -hmm. but the steps are pretty much. Yeah, it just looks like this. And when you drag in your tracks, they just line up like that. Yeah, yeah. So sorry about that. <laughs> um, but thankful that thankful that something is the plug. Yes, please. Could you say a little bit about how folks are using Zoom to podcast? Yeah. That's become really popular. Yeah. And particularly during the pandemic it was like you know oh you can just podcast from home and all of that mm -hmm. and i think that's going to be really a lot of importance to teachers because if you have students or you're trying to do a project in a very short time frame mm -hmm. it would be much easier to like get a hold of someone to interview you can say hey we'll just log in on zoom and we'll do your interview that way so we don't have to shuttle students across town or wherever yeah. So could you talk a little bit about like how folks are doing it and really getting that really good sound quality? Because that's like what it kind of mystified me on how they're doing it. Sure, sure. Yes. Um, so I know people who just do Zoom. There's a couple ways you can do it. Of course, if you're using a laptop, you can sit there, you know, and speak into the speaker and it's fine. It's not the best quality you can get. Um, when you do Zoom, you can um, select the option for download. You can do video, and then you can also isolate uh, the audio, and it'll download a separate MP3. So that's great for that. Um, if you want to step it up just a little bit more, you can get um, an external mic to plug in to your computer. Um, you can get one for, you know, 40, 50 bucks, um, and it'll sound much better than just picking up the, the sound from your speaker. Um, and you can get a USB mic, plug it right in, um, and that works great. I know lots of people that do that. Um, you can also get a, you know, much nicer mic and plug it in. You can plug it into that red um, um, box that I showed you. Yeah. The, yep, exactly. Um, you can do it that way so that you can adjust the levels a little bit better than just on your, you know, on your computer settings. Um, that's a really nice way, especially if you're doing... Interviews, I imagine a lot of you are probably getting interview requests from media outlets or, um, you know, if you're doing virtual conferences and things, you can set that up um, for that as well. Um, so there's that. And then um, a lot of our reporters will have to do like quick interviews on the phone. And so I have them use Zoom on their phone and just talk, you know, no Bluetooth, no speaker, just hold it up to their, um, you know, hold it up like they're taking a phone call. And that's actually pretty decent audio too. So there's a number of ways you can do it with, uh, with and without purchasing additional equipment. Um, but the uh, media outlets that are using Zoom, I think that they're most likely, you know, they have some sort of mic set up. Now, are they getting like any kind of like premium subscription to Zoom or anything like that in terms of the quality of the service is it, or will the regular Zoom suffice? I don't think that they're um, that they're using any like step up. I think they're okay. just using yeah. Okay. Um, and of course with the is it's it's still the free, it's only 30 minutes and then you have to pay for the pro or whatever and it's longer. But I don't think you get any like additional technical support or features with the paid. Um, but yeah it's a it's a Great way to, especially it removes that barrier. You know, if someone's trying to talk with someone, you know, an hour away or in another state, you know, it's just such a great way to kind of broaden your options of who you want to who you want to speak to. So, I think it's great. Oh, uh, cool. question. Yes, Desiree. 
Yes, more questions for you. So, two quick questions. Um, I was using like Final Cut and iMovie when I was working in the MCS department as a student. Mm -hmm. So, I was wondering like the functionality between like Audacity um, and Audition versus ones that include the video. And if it's basically the same thing when it comes to like the audio um, editing portion of it. Yeah. If we wanted to have like a video version of it and then an audio version. Yeah. Um it should it shouldn't matter. Um I use Premiere mostly for audio editing. Of course that's a um Adobe product, so that easily speaks to um audition easily speaks with Premiere, but as long as the file type um is acceptable, it it shouldn't make a difference. Um, what you edit it in, as long as it's an MP3 um, or Wave, um, it should accept it, and you shouldn't have a problem, to my knowledge. Okay. Um, another question I had is: Is there a way to annotate like different markers within the timestamp? So, I it's very time consuming doing this and perfecting this. So I was wondering if there's like bookmarks you can put into it. Yep. Besides like the file names, but like having bookmarks in the timestamp. Yep, within the file. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Um, I think am I able to share again, Courtney? Oh yeah. Okay. Um I'm just gonna try to show you in audition. I use uh markers a lot. So you can mark either a stop at an endpoint, or you can highlight the whole thing, and then you can rename the marker. Um, let's say so you can put those in to specific points and just have like a quick reference point. I used to use that a lot, like if I was doing a longer interview, because I would have all these on paper, but it's nice to have them in the file too. Um, and then if you have a bunch, you can like click through and it'll like list them. So that's just one way. Okay, that's perfect. That's exactly what I was looking for. Okay. And then my last question, I'm sorry, is no how do you, <laughs> how do you um, address issues with like enunciation like let's say I'm like doing an interview of um someone out in a neighborhood and they have like a really strong accent or they're not enunciating their words I mean if with video we have like captions but how do you deal with that with audio podcasting that's a great question um this may not speak directly to it but one thing that I'll do and, and tell people to do when you first start your interview have the person introduce themselves and then you have the pronunciation of their name. Um, if it's a situation of them not enunciating or, or you having trouble or you think the listener might have trouble following them, I don't really have a good answer. The only thing I've, I've done in the past is if, um, if I need to have an interpreter you know, have the, the voices together or have, you know, the, the, the person that I'm interviewing, they'll talk for, you know, I'll have their voice for five seconds and then I'll have the interpreter come in or um, you might yourself as the narrator, let the person say what they're saying for however long and then you can come back in and sort of give a little context. So saying, you know, um, uh, Dennis, uh, talked about, you know, his time serving in World War II or something like that, you know, just to kind of, for anyone who may not be following as closely, you kind of give them re reinforce what the person said. Um, I think those are the only, has anyone else had um, experience with this and have ideas? Would it be similar to like dubbing? 
Mm -hmm. Dubbing sounds, like if you were kind of having a sound, on, like if you had lowered the volume of the person and maybe had a sound on top where it kind of, well, I mean, I know they do that for like translations. Um, I just wasn't sure like how to address that without captions. Yeah. Well, I was saying the only thing I could think of is if you use the tracking or the narration to kind of just restate what was said, but in a different way, mm -hmm. so that the listener could catch like what what that person was talking about, right? At least, and then they'd be able to go at least know what the what the content was about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but that is um that is a good question because, like you said, there's there's no when it's just audio, you know, all you have is is a voice, whether it's yours, theirs, or you know, someone else that you're bringing in. Um, yeah. And I always encourage, you know, ha as much as possible, ha having the person's voice present. Um, and then just if you need to kind of have an additional voice to, like you said, restate, um, but, ha you know, so, so not so not editing that person so thoroughly or, you know, cut cutting them down to like little sound bites. Um, so I feel like depending on the listener, they're, they're willing to, to be present and like, listen to that person. Hopefully, um, you just kind of have to get a little creative and, and how you, how you do it. I'm sorry. I don't have a better, um, more advice for that. No, that's good. I appreciate that. Great questions. I think I saw another hand up, um, on the chat. Yeah. Another answer. Uh, no, okay, maybe that was Desiree. I was going to mention, uh, Desiree asked about like the, the pros and the cons around using something like Final Cut Pro for the audio. Is that correct? Am I restating that correctly? Wait, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the advantages of using Audacity or Audition or one of the other audio platforms is you'd have more tools mm -hmm. than Final Cut Pro. Like you can do basics in Final Cut Pro with the audio, but you have some more enhanced tools with that specific software. So like, let's say you want to filter out the air conditioner in the background of a recording, you can do that in those programs. I don't think you can do that in Final Cut Pro. Mm -hmm. um, but then you can do some other tricks. Like if you want to like go in the equalizer and, and make someone's voice a little warmer or, you know, there's a little more, more things you can tinker with. Yeah, um, but for the basic stuff, yeah, you can do it in Final Cut Pro. You can fade out in Final Cut Pro. You know, you can do all of that stuff. Thank you. Can, can you maybe show like the equalizer and and the ambient sound or what? Not ambient sound, but the air conditioner. Oh, that that is past my uh, past my expertise like for reduction. Voice reduction, yeah. Okay, for the you yeah. can remove? Yeah. You probably get really good audio and you don't. So Oh no. <laughs> I just it's, try it's to a little tricky. Like if you um if you like if you're doing a recording and you just let it be silent for a minute, mm -hmm. you can tell that noise reduction to isolate that sound and strip it mm -hmm. from the rest of the recording. Gotcha. I've never yeah. had success with that. I've had it lessen it but never remove so I might have to take class well, <laughs> you don't want to rely on it because it condenses mm -hmm. the track yeah so if you don't have good quality with the rest of the track it'll make the voices sound yes weird yeah so you don't want to rely you want to be in a space with no noise mm -hmm. get the best quality but it's a tool that you can use if, if that becomes something you need yeah yeah I had a, um, a situation where I outsourced that <laughs> to, um, to, oh my God. Good thing. <laughs> you close it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> That's how we're going to end this, uh, this evening with me falling into the hole. Um, where I, um, I got some, some tape from, it's like a, it was around the 50s, um, from the Maryland Historical Society. Um, for the Wavelength Project, but it was a tape that they had then uh, recorded onto another uh, type of 
thing. And then it was, it was just like, it had been through so many different transfers that um, there was just like this, like squeal on it. And I asked our um, engineer at the time if he could do something because he's just like a, a scientific, just mastermind with, with uh, doing some of these like filters and, and processes. Um, and that was part of the problem is it, it made the, the person's voice so high pitched and condensed that it was like this delicate balance. And he got it much better, but I know he spent a lot of time on it. So for some things, I'm just like, someone else <laughs> but you do have so many options um within i can't obviously i can't speak for audacity but audition there's so many things that you can do um that it's it's that can smooth out and sharpen and and just polish your audio and and to dr brooks's point one thing that i didn't um add and i just want to navigate back to this page just in case anybody wants to see any of these links um uh just make sure that as much as you can control the environment in the beginning as possible, it will help you if, you know, and some things you can't control. Like I've had so many recordings where a person is talking to me from their home and their, um, what is it? Their smoke alarm or carbon monoxide is beeping. Do yes. Dogs barking in the background. You know, there's only so much you can do. Uh, the ambulance that, that races by, you know, then you want it for that you know, you're, you, you can say, can we stop for a minute until that goes by? But, you know, if it's persistent sounds, there's not much you can do about it. You can ask them to go in another room, but you also kind of might not want to inconvenience them. Change that battery. Yeah, right? <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah, I remember the interview with the, the battery. It's just like, beep. it's so bad. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I have a question about just like, when you do the interview... I've always, like, protocol, I guess, would be the, the realm of this question. Like, the 30-second ambient sound at the beginning, is that real, or is that something I just... I, yeah, I like to get that. Okay. Yeah. Because um, that can also help if they're... Just to cover, mm -hmm. uh, especially with, with cuts, like, if you're making in... Describe that. If you're making cuts with, like, in the body of the conversation... Mm -hmm having some ambient sound to like put under, to put behind that cut. Yeah, it can really help to blend and kind of trick the ear that you made a cut. Okay, I've never known why. <laughs> yeah, or transitions too. Okay, I'll put some in. Um, we didn't talk about just cuts in general. Um, I guess we don't, we don't have to spend time on that since we have two minutes left, but just if you have to cut, just try to make it as clean as possible, you know, that you're not clipping a breath or that you're not leaving in, you know, a, a, a consonant or part of a word, um, because that is, it takes people out. Um, and I can, you know, show how, how to make those cuts as, you know, precise as possible. But, um, you know, that's one of the main things that I think is sort of distracting to people beyond the, the beeping or the external noises is if you can hear like cuts over and over again, um, then, then that can be distracting. Um, and you want people to, you know, hear what you intended them to hear and not be distracted by other things. So, but it takes time. All these things take time, um, no matter how big your project is. You know, just the time with finding people to talk to and, and spending time interviewing them takes, takes time. So, but I think it's worth it. <laughs> um, I just have some resources up here. Um, for some training videos and resources, um, some good stuff, some books. Um, I have my contacts there if anybody wants to reach out with any questions after. And I... Okay. So we can share this with folks after. The okay, great. And I just wanted to give a plug. Um, so one of the new responsibilities that I'm taking on at the banner is we have this program called Creatives in Residence, which is a uh, year-long program where we work with writers and artists um, who want to um, talk about their own experiences, their life in our coverage area, which is Baltimore City County, uh, Howard County, Anne Arundel County. I think I'm missing one more. Um, people have written um, cut sort of commentaries, essays, poems, um, and I'm going to be working on this uh, this year. And so the program, stay tuned. Uh, applications are supposed to be open 
um, in March, TB, TBD, but just since I'm here with creative people, I wanted to put in a plug. Um, everything you write, everything that you produce for the program, it is a paid opportunity, and there's lots of other benefits, so um, feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions, and I'll keep you posted. What's that? Oh, just, I was hinting at Joelle to apply for it. Do it? She gave me a look back. I was like, get that. <laughs> <laughs> Be happy to talk to you about it. Um, you, you need to see more of the, I know the info about it, but. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what's considered a creative. Um, I don't know if I would fit into that. Is a it's podcast big, episode, like, produce, would that be something for you? You know, I would advocate for it. Right now, we're just saying words and images. Okay. But I would advocate. Especially if you, yeah, especially if you have some sort of text component to it where maybe you can include some writing and then we can have audio placed within the page because we are a website so so much is like words and, and visuals but um we do have audio here and there and video um so if you want to do it let me know and i will advocate strongly for it <laughs> I, yeah. I really appreciated the most, I think it was the beginning of the month, it was a creative resident article about uh, meatballs and baby shower. Quality. Yeah, it was about like, yeah, about quintessential dishes in the black community. Yes. And they said meatballs at a baby shower. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but like, yeah, there's always those meatballs. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Yeah, so people have written about, like, a wide gamut of things. Um, so we, we really kind of leave it to uh, the creators, the creatives, to dictate what they want to produce. Um, we, of course, are there to edit and to give guidance, but um, we don't tell people, you know, what to focus on. And I, I love that. So um, just wanted to get that plug before I left, <laughs> before we closed out. But certainly, if anybody has any questions, I can stick around. Please feel free to reach out to me after um, we can continue the conversation. Um, there was someone earlier in the chat who just said um, if you could share resources about music, so we can oh, yes. that in the follow up. Yep. Should I just email those to you? Yeah. Okay. Yep. I've got. I'm um, sitting out on my website. I have a link of music resources. Okay. It's a. Uh, Okay. All right. Well, Thanks, everyone. Thank you all so much for coming today. Really appreciate it and the great questions. Have a good weekend. Thanks, Everybody everyone. Care. Have a good one. Bye. Thank you so much.